Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, The Kaepernick Effect is a new book by our guest, Dave Zirin, who is sports editor for The Nation magazine and the author of 10 books on the politics of sports, including Jim Brown, Last Man Standing. His website is at edgeofsports.com. Dave Zirin, welcome to Talk World Radio. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for the terrific book. Uh, it's got numerous stories of athletes at the high school, college, and professional levels who were inspired to kneel during the national anthem or take other similar actions by Colin Kaepernick. Uh, can you just remind people of what Kaepernick did and when that was? Absolutely. I mean, we're talking August 2016, a meaningless preseason game where Colin Kaepernick made the decision that he was going to sit during the national anthem. And he wasn't doing it for any notice or attention. He even sat on the benches behind his teammates. But one reporter for the NFL Network, Steve Weish, saw him do it, intuited that there was a big story there, connected it with some of Kaepernick's social media posts that he had done after the police killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile over that summer asked him about it, and Colin Kaepernick just went off about policing in the United States. And that's what led to a really a four-month journey where Colin Kaepernick took a knee uh, before every game as a symbolic protest and about the gap between what this country says it offers and the lived experiences of Black, Ameri Black Americans uh, in the United States. So that's the basis of Colin Kaepernick. But but then, of course, the story is much bigger than that, both on the NFL level, where he couldn't get signed after that season, has been colluded against for the last four years. But then, of course, there's the subject, and that's what most people focus on, but then there's the subject of this book, which is about the, the catalytic effect it had on young athletes in small towns and big cities throughout the United States. And, and, and Kaepernick, uh, as you recount in the book, knew beforehand that he might lose his career over this, right? And he did it anyway. Well, he knew there was a good chance of that. Uh, he was, at the time, a 29-year-old quarterback. He was coming off an injury. Uh, he'd taken his team to the Super Bowl. He was still considered a tremendous talent. But he also knew that he wasn't Tom Brady. And, and thank goodness for that, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> But but he knew that it came with real risk. And honestly, that's what that's what gave what he did so much meaning. Um, because we all knew it was accompanied by risk. We all knew he was playing for a league that's notoriously right wing in ownership circles, and also a league that uh has non guaranteed contracts. So he put it all on the line and he lost it all. And he still has no regrets for what he did. And that's the part of it that I think really does serve to inspire people. You know, this, this sense of sacrifice and risk. And, and this generated all kinds of activism, including what you recount in the book that we'll talk about, uh, but, but also led or helped fuel in, in later years the, this major uprising around Black Lives Matter. And, and there is a connection in a sort of a pair of, of kneelings, right? Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, and this is one of the, art. I mean, let me take a quick, I mean, you're talking about the juxtaposition of Derek Chauvin uh, the, 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 the cop who killed George Floyd kneeling on his neck and, of course, the image of Kaepernick taking his knee in a peaceful gesture to stop police brutality. And that juxtaposition was visible on signs throughout the summer of 2020, um, where you had the largest set of protests in the history of the United States. And I should say that, you know, when I started the book, which was at the very start of the pandemic, I just started interviewing people about their experiences, it was meant to be just sort of a retrospective. So we didn't forget this part of the story, all the young athletes who'd taken a knee. But then when summer hit and the protests hit, it became clear to me, I then went back and talked to a lot of the people I'd already spoken with. It became clear to me that, you know, while many roads may have led to those mass protests in 2020, one of those roads was definitely forged 
by Colin Kaepernick's actions and the effect that it had on all of these athletes, because what they did was they brought the protests, they brought Black Lives Matter to all kinds of towns and frankly, to all kinds of athletic fields where a lot of folks, particularly a lot of white folks, felt like they would be safe from the specter of protests, safe from having to think about dead bodies in the streets at the hands of police. And these athletes would not allow people to feel safe. They made sure that they were as uncomfortable as they were uh, in these United States. So I think that what Kaepernick did, uh, what it's, it's not like he is the reason why the 2020 protests happened, obviously, but when we look at the roads that led us there, I think he was the engineer of one of the major ones. I, I think you've helped make that case with this book, uh, which has incredible stories of young people, uh, starts out with, with high school athletes. Can you talk about, about some of these athletes who took this step? Well, I mean, high school is such an important time um, for, for me to focus on. First of all, uh, because so many, so much of the 2020 protests, I mean, it was a youth movement. And, you know, people call them Zoomers or Generation Z. It's, it's people, my, my daughter's age, who's 17 years old, you know, people who have no living memory of 9-11 to pick up on the 20th anniversary that's taking place this month. You know, so, so they're they're coming at this from a completely different perspective about the world and how it exists. And they have a lot of impatience for the, about this world um, because it, this generate this, the, 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 this world, especially this country, I would argue is, is in the clutches of a anti-democratic right-wing cabal. And what these young people represent is impatience with that. I mean, this generation, this young generation is, more diverse and less tolerant of intolerance than any generation in the history of the United States. And it doesn't surprise me when you look at it from that perspective that the athletes of this generation would not be uh, somehow inoculated uh, from that political consciousness. And I wanted to, to really highlight that. And, you know, it, it's a wide, diverse, uh, it's a very, it's a very diverse uh, patina of stories. Um, in the high school section and the college section. I mean, I'll tell you, like, basically what I did what for the book was I threw open the doors. And I was like, if you're in high school, put the word out, you know? And I, and I looked up old newspapers and, and tracked down these athletes. And I just said, look, if you took a knee, I don't care whether you were in Beaumont, Texas, or Seattle, Washington. I want to hear your story. And by doing it that way, I mean, I, I kind of like that, it, that it's, it's diverse because what it shows is that, you know, even though obviously – what happened to the, the effect on the lives of these athletes by taking a knee, uh, it, you know, really did depend on whether they were in some big liberal community or whether they were in a very small right wing area. Like, of course, the reaction was dependent on that. But a lot of the motivations are, are just the same, you know, no matter where somebody is, because people have been affected by a national movement and a national struggle. And a lot of them, as you describe in the book, which which makes it a, a much richer educational experience to read the book, I think, or drawing on their own personal experiences with racist policing, for example. And, and, and a lot of them are black. Some of them are white. Some of them are drawing on personal experiences. Some of them aren't, I think. Right. I think that's a great point and an important one, because one of the things that I also try to argue in the book is that the, that if you listen to these young people, they weren't taking a knee because of Colin Kaepernick. They weren't doing it in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick's struggle in the NFL. What Colin Kaepernick gave to them was a language with which to protest. What Colin Kaepernick gave to them was a method by which they could be heard. What Colin Kaepernick gave to them was almost like the keys or permission to be able to take the protest to the athletic field, to take the protest to the national anthem. That was new. And that's what Colin Kaepernick brought to the table. He's certainly not the first athlete to ever protest on the field or anything like that. But to take it to that anthemic space, I mean, it was really something that, you know, we hadn't seen in sports in a quarter century. And when that happened previously, that was a player named Mahmoud Abdul Rauf in 1996. Uh, when that happened 25 years ago, it was done independently of a, of a movement. It was Raouf doing it by his own volition. 
So you didn't have that kind of amen chorus in the streets saying, yes, we're going to do that too. But what I found was that these young people, they, they took that language and ran with it precisely as you said, David, because of their own frustrations with the state of justice in the United States um, and their own anger about some of their individual experiences. But particularly the name that kept coming up time and time again for these young people, no matter whether we're talking about Seattle, Washington or Beaumont, Texas, uh, was the name Trayvon Martin. And by doing this book, It'll, you know, Trayvon Martin was, was killed by George Zimmerman uh, nine years ago. And by doing this book, what it, what it really made me realize and tune into uh, was that for these young people, that was a generational trauma. I mean, they were, they, were, they were very young. They would have been 10, 11, 12 years old. And they see this young person who looks like he's around their age get stalked and killed by a wannabe police officer. And then that person did not face any legal uh, ramifications. Yeah. And for them, I mean, that, that, that's their version of what Emmett Till was for a generation of civil rights activists coming up in the 1950s. And I didn't realize the, the import of the killing of Trayvon Martin until I spoke to all these young people. And they saw him, the, his killer, not just not held accountable, but celebrated and glorified by certain segments. Um, we're speaking with Dave Zirin. The book, which I highly recommend, is The Kaepernick Effect. Um, these young people, uh, these athletes in, in general, I think in many of the cases you recounted, tried to get the rest of the team to join them uh, with, with very limited results. I think understandable because, as you also recount, they got death threats. They got assaults. They got fired from their jobs when we're talking about the, the, the professional level, right? Right. And, you know, people had their families threatened at the high school level. Uh, there are stories of police harassment um, outside their home. I mean, a whole variety of things. Again, very based on uh, the town in which they were. But you, you, you mentioned a great common thread, like with only a few exceptions, uh, the, the, the effort to try to get the entire team involved, I mean, usually required it. I have a couple of examples of that in the book, but it usually requires the intervention of a very supportive and very conscious coach in the process. Um, without that, I mean, sports can be a very authoritarian endeavor. It just is. I'm a youth coach and, you know, even I see this on my own teams that I coach, even though I'm not an authoritarian, it just develops out of directing young people to do drills and to listen. And it can be a very authoritarian process, uh, much different than say a, a history classroom, for example, where you try to get students to take ownership of the structure of a class. It's, it's just very different. Um, I'd like it to be less authoritarian, but it is what it is. It's like arguing about you know gravity when you're falling out of an airplane. And so when you have a coach say, hey, we should listen to this player, uh, let's, let's celebrate the solidarity of this moment and us coming together as a team, then you see other people on the team say, yeah, well, that makes sense. Let's do this. Let's try to stand for something. But when it's a young person on their own, I mean, and they're getting only half support from their coach, and you know the pressures that are going to come in and the, the amount of rocks that are going to fall on their back, I mean, that's a very, very tough position. And so that's why I also wanted to celebrate these young people, because we all know, no matter how old we are listening to this podcast, we all remember high school. And we all know how hard it is to stand out on your own when you're a teenager. And that's what these young people are doing. And they're doing so as athletes, which also means they're surrendering the kind of entitlement and privilege that comes with a college, be, being a high school or a college athlete. Yeah. Like they're putting themselves out there to be derided by the same community that wants to celebrate them and put them on a pedestal. And so that in and of itself also made it very admirable to me because they're taking the imposition of entitlement that's being handed to them and saying, I don't want it. Not when there are dead bodies in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. And they did inspire others, uh, not just you. They, and, and, 
And, and one of the, a number of the stories are a type of athlete I hadn't thought about, uh, namely cheerleaders. Um, yeah. and, and, and we question, you know, what does this, you know, demonstration out on a field without any discussion accomplish? But uh, in a number of cases, and I'm thinking of one of the cheerleaders in particular, she ends up organizing a whole assembly of the school and it becomes this educational process that is lengthy and substantive, right? Huge, yeah, and that was in the city of New Orleans, a place that has seen uh, its share of, of course, uh, institutionalized racism flower in the ugliest possible ways, thinking most concretely about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which, which also, you know, people like myself have to remember, Hurricane Katrina was 16 years ago. So you've got, you know, a cheerleader who may not have been born then or may have just been born, um, feeling like like still feeling of a, a very close connection to that history with regards to their city and taking this kind of stand like I, I love that story about the cheerleader because you know you, you can read the book and think that like this is all a kind of uh, jobian sacrifice where people go out there and they they, they 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 take that knee and you know they feel like they did the right thing but they also just had to take just mountains of, of crap for doing it and suffer for doing it the way Colin Kaepernick has had to suffer for doing it. But it's not always about suffering. Sometimes starting these conversations really can be transformative for a given community. And that needs to be celebrated as well, because we need to be able to show young people that, you know, this isn't just about, you know, running into hell with a gasoline suit on, uh, you know, you can also be transformative for your community um if you can provoke people to have conversation and if you can provoke people to listen and if you can back up what you're doing you know w w with a plan for yeah. what your community can do to see positive change the the nfl as you recount dave siren uh tried to make an example of kaepernick tried to dissuade any future nfl players from doing anything of the sort I wonder to what extent you think that was a success or, or a failure. I, I mean, because Kaepernick inspired all of these people across the country, all of these sports leagues, perhaps the book doesn't go there, but perhaps beyond the United States as well. well very much. Um, and, and he got some minor financial settlement, but he hasn't got a job. Um, but the NFL has had to sort of pretend to come around. They now have six approved social justice mottos you can stick on your helmet. I don't know what you make of that. Did they <laughs> did they succeed in their effort to uh, to make him a model uh, to to teach the lesson? Thou shalt not take a stand on on our field. You know. Well, it's it's a great question, and I think it's an open question because um, on the one hand we see their strategy because it's one of the oldest strategies in the history of, of power, which is, you know, carrot and stick. I mean, come on. I mean, we're, we're talking going back to feudalism. I mean, th this is how power maintains itself, carrot and stick. So they put out the carrot of the decals and the social justice groups while not making any substantive change when it comes to the number of black coaches, black executives, there are still no black franchise owners in the National Football League, but they'll put end racism up in the end zone and say, look at us, we're listening. And they'll say Black Lives Matter. And the commissioner, Roger Goodell, will even say, we should have listened more to Colin Kaepernick when he when he spoke. And, you know, that that's all fine and good, but here's Colin Kaepernick still without a job. And that's the stick because it sends a message to all the players out there. They want Colin Kaepernick to be a ghost story. They Because what they don't want are restive players, particularly restive black players in their league. So they have been somewhat successful in employing this carrot and stick strategy over the last five years. However, the, the caveat that I'll put down just to say, you know, the story is not yet written, is that you also have a generation of athletes coming up who view Colin Kaepernick as a hero, uh, who don't view him as a cautionary tale who don't view him as a ghost story, but view him instead as a kind of animating spirit. And that's not going anywhere. And we'll see how that plays out in the, in the years ahead.
you know, this was a very interesting story for me when it happened. Um, it was it was explicitly, you know, not a protest of a military war song, but it gained attention. It was brilliant and it had power because of the willingness to violate the taboos around protesting a military war mad society. Uh, and some of us were very pleased by that and wished it was a protest of militarism. Uh, and others, of course, used that as the, the means to criticize. Uh, how dare you? You know, uh, I, I wonder how much of the backlash do you think was was racism and how much was was militarism? Uh, wow. I mean, as, as Dr. King caught, taught us, uh, how do we disentangle racism and militarism uh, and throw in, as King said, corporatism in there as well. It's very difficult to, to, to take the strings out and say, well, it's just this or just this. I mean, certainly the backlash against Kaepernick was fundamentally driven by racism. Absolutely. With a cover of militarism given as a way to say he was doing this to protest the troops, which wasn't true, or to protest the anthem which was actually interesting because a lot of Kaepernick defenders will say that's not true either. He wasn't protesting the anthem. And it's like, well, <laughs> he kind of was, though. Um, you know, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. Like what he's protesting is, first of all, that this anthem has a terribly racist history. It has verses we do not sing. Uh, and, and I talk about that in the book. But also, it is about the gap. That's what this protest has been about. It's about the gap between what this country and what that anthem promises and the lived experience of black Americans. And in that regard, it is a protest of the United States. It is a protest of, of systemic racism, and it is a protest of that anthem. Yeah. Now, um, he was not protesting militarism. That was not part of, of what it was, but you know, let's take a closer look at that. I mean, when we look at the state of our militarized police departments in this country, the amount of interaction between the military and local departments, the amount of hardware, the amount of equipment, hell, the amount of training, counterinsurgency training that now takes place. I mean, I would argue that it was also a protest against militarism. I mean, when Colin Kaepernick says the problem is that um, police are getting away with people are dying in the street. This is a quote. People are dying in the streets and police are getting away with murder. That, to me, is a critique of domestic militarism. Absolutely. And, and, and people didn't used to be able to do this protest because they didn't used to play the national anthem or have celebrations of militarism, sometimes paid for with tax dollars at the beginning of every sports event. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the difference in recent years, I mean, there, there's a post 9-11 discussion to have as well. Uh, and people should read the book, The Heritage by Howard Bryant for a full excavation of that. But post 9-11, um, you start seeing these partnerships between sports leagues and the military. And part of that partnership was this new thing that you're describing where in the NFL, I should say specifically, because in other sports leagues, it was different. But in the NFL, the idea of bringing players out onto the field so they could have their helmet in hand during the national anthem. I mean, that's only people talk about this. Like I remember saying that Colin Kaepernick was violating this grand tradition and it's like this grand tradition, which is only about at the time nine years old. Yeah. I mean, that's not much of a grand tradition. Uh, if you know, you're. I think I, I wrote about it at the time and said, I think Fast and Furious Three came out uh, the year this grand tradition began. I mean, it's come on, it doesn't go back to Teddy Roosevelt. This goes back to a post nine eleven commercial partnership between the military and the NFL. And by and this is the other thing to me that justified what Kaepernick did um, by imposing this song on the players. I mean, we either live in a free society or won't or don't or we don't, you know, they then have the right to respond to that in any way in which they see fit. That to me, that that's an expression of freedom of speech. And people say, well, it's a private business. And it's like, well, are you asked to say the national anthem at your workplace at a private business? And second of all, how can we call these private businesses when they get hundreds of millions of dollars in public funds to build stadiums, not to mention tax breaks and the like? So uh, I think even people, people who are intellectually honest, even if they disagree with Colin Kaepernick, 
should be able to say he has the right to protest, you know, wh- wh- whenever the hell he wants, quite frankly, as long as it's not, you know, on the 50 yard line in the middle of a game. <laughs> I don't care if he does it then either myself. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that could conceivably be a fireable offense. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, that might be relevant to his, to his job performance. Um, yeah. the, 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 we we got just a, a few minutes left, Dave Zirin. The, these athletes, pro and college and high school, that did this uh, kneeling uh, years ago now and took all kinds of grief for it, then years later they saw this uprising and this cultural change and the statues dropping like flies and legislation mm-hmm. being changed in some cases. And you asked a number of them if they felt vindicated uh, by what they had done. What did they? How did they tend to respond to that? Uh, in some cases, a sense of profound vindication, which can only come through mass struggle, you know, and that's an amazing thing. When I went back and talked to the people uh, who I'd interviewed before the summer protests, and then I went back and spoke to them again, because I asked them about vindication before the protests, and a lot of them were like, no, I don't feel vindicated. People are still dying. I don't feel vindicated. Uh, you know, the, the work still has to get done. Like very serious minded people. Like there is no finish line. There is no vindication. But a lot of them, when those protests were happening in 2020, did feel that sense of vindication because, you know, mass struggle is almost like society saying to you as a whole in one voice, yes, you are right to do this. And that's, that's very powerful. That's very powerful. It reminded me, I'm so, and I'm so glad they were able to see this within a few short years because I wrote a book with John Carlos, the, the 1968 Olympian who raised his fist on the medal stand in Mexico City. And I, I had first met John in 2003 and he still had not felt a sense of vindication at all. Um, he'd actually, he'd uh, instead, instead a real sense of, of anger that people didn't realize why he did what he did. But then as the as the movement started to grow in more recent years, John started to feel like, yes, it did matter. You know, so he had to wait 50 years to feel that sense of profound vindication. And I'm really glad that for these young people, they got to at least feel in their hearts that they were on the right side of history in a shorter amount of time. Absolutely. Uh- one minute left, Dave Zirin. Is is kneeling still a good tactic? Should people be out there doing it still? Uh, it depends on the situation. I mean, the old expression in politics, timing is everything. Uh, Sanction kneeling by clubs is a way to show that they're socially conscious. It doesn't do a great deal. <laughs> You're not impressed. <laughs> it's like the old expression, you know, if your protest is boss approved, it's probably not a protest. Um but if you're, but you know, but I'm not one of those people who says like, oh, kneeling doesn't mean anything anymore. Because if you're, if you're in Beaumont, Texas, and you decide to take a knee, you know, that not only takes a lot of guts, you're also guaranteed to provoke the kind of backlash, which is going to affect your life and the life of your loved ones. So, you know, it's all situational. Yeah. But for people who keep it going and do it in dangerous circumstances, they deserve our absolutely unequivocal solidarity and support. They do. And you can read about a number of them in the book, The Kaepernick Effect, by our guest, Dave Zirin. Dave, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Oh, thank you. I was real thrilled to do it. World Radio, I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.